Uh, we're going to uh, continue to, to talk on epilepsy um, with our uh, new uh, uh, chair of the uh, Division of Neurosurgery here at, uh, at Boonshaw, Professor. Uh, joining us in our Neuroscience Institute, uh, Jeff Schweitzer. And we're so pleased to have him here. Uh, he was uh, one of our uh, early successes, I think, in recruitment. And uh, uh, he's going to be the focus for building an epilepsy, uh, an epilepsy surgery program and a uh, movement disorders and uh, uh, surgical program around that. So really pleased to have him here. Uh, Jeff has uh, had training at uh, Harvard, uh, UCLA, uh, Yale. Uh, he's uh, developed an interest in uh, functional and neurosurgery and epilepsy uh, and, uh, neurosurgery. Uh, he is uh, an MD and PhD. Uh, is uh, uh, I think going to bring some really great strengths to um, uh, to our neuroscience institute uh, program. So, uh, a pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Jeff. Uh, he's going to talk about surgical aspects of epilepsy. So. Switch from basic science to clinical and from PC to Mac. to talk today. Um, this is going to be a bit of a change of pace, but uh, I want to thank Dr. McDonald for, for leading in so nicely to what I'm going to talk about here, which is really clinical application of the uh, scientific uh, research that, that he and others have done. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be working in a field of functional neurosurgery, which is really at the edge of translation between basic science and clinical practice. Most people who go into neurosurgery will tell you that they're inspired to do that because they're fascinated by how the brain works, just as neurologists are, and yet most of us spend our time taking out blood clots and putting screws into bone. Uh, I'm one of the rare individuals who's fortunate enough to see neurophysiology in action in, in awake patients in the operating room, which is just not only a source of endless fascination, but provides a, a real practical interface for moving from the lab to the clinic. Today I'm going to stick mostly to the MD side of things and show you a little bit about epilepsy surgery. I'm going to make the point that epilepsy surgery is not a new idea. Uh, it has simply become a better idea as time has gone by. This is just taken off the internet. That is a uh, picture of Cao Cao, who was the uh, ancient Chinese general at the end of the Han Dynasty and kind of the, the bad guy who everybody loves to hate. Uh, this is Wikipedia's interpretation of, of the story about him, but uh, something was wrong with his brain at the end of his life, and many people interpreted this as uh, a meningioma with complex partial seizures because of some of his peculiar behaviors. There was a, a famous Chinese physician named Hua Tuo, who is also uh, recognized as the inventor of <coughs> anesthesia, and he proposed cutting open Cao Cao's head to fix what was wrong with him, uh, at which point Cao Cao had been executed for treason. Um, his works were burned, and that sort of put an end to the idea of epilepsy surgery for about 1,800 years. <laughs> the, the, some of these numbers have been pointed out. Epilepsy is an extremely common disease, and, and I repeat what Dr. McDonald said about the difference between seizures and epilepsy, both very common. About 1 in 26 people will be diagnosed with epilepsy at some point during life. About 140,000 new cases are diagnosed each year. Uh, they, these are figures from the CDC. Uh, this annual cost of 15.5 billion in medical costs is, is really a staggering figure. Um, again, look at these numbers in a different way. Uh, I'm, I'm going to now talk a little bit about uh, the symptomatic epilepsies as opposed to the idiopathic epilepsies that Dr. McDonald was speaking of. But I'm going to make the point also that there's not a clean separation between those things, as illustrated by the fact that it's, it's very well recognized that people with a family history of post-traumatic epilepsy are more likely to suffer from post-traumatic epilepsy themselves. There's an interaction between the genetics 
and the abnormal substrates, tumors, strokes, and so forth, uh, that we don't fully understand. Uh, and I think this speaks very well to the point that Dr. McDonald was making at the end there about knowing a gene in isolation from its surrounding, from its network, from its context, is an incomplete story. Well, at this point, as I'll, I'll talk about in this presentation, for surgery, we are still very much limited to what we can <coughs> see in the tech. But there's more work to be done here, and I think as time goes by, these idiopathic polygenic epilepsies and the symptomatic epilepsies that I will be talking about are going to be seen to be aspects of the same kind of uh, network problem. As many as 45% of people with partial seizures, meaning non-primary generalized epilepsies, are poorly controlled in spite of medications. Uh, there have been a lot of new medications in the last few years. None of these have really been a dramatic breakthrough in control of seizures. So who is a candidate for an operation for epilepsy? Uh, these are selected patients who fail medical trials. Uh, there has been a push in recent years, and I think appropriately so, to define the number of trials that constitute failure. Generally, if a patient doesn't succeed with three successive trials of epileptic medication, they are looked at as possible surgical candidates. How long do those trials take? Well, all of us in this field have seen that take 20 years or longer. It, it probably shouldn't. Uh, there may be as many as 90,000 people in this country at this moment who are candidates for surgery, but very few of them actually get worked up for this. And, you know, unfortunately, the recent paper here that you see quoted at the bottom from Neurology shows that the number of people, despite the fact that we have class one evidence that epilepsy surgery is effective, safe and effective for these people, there are actually fewer people coming to surgery now than was the case in 1990. Now, you know, that's a discussion for another day. I think there's economic factors, factors involved here. I think this has partly to do with the control of medicine increasingly by uh, people who are looking at bottom line costs and the fact that cost effectiveness for epilepsy surgery uh, is measured over a lifetime rather than over six months. But clearly this is a therapy that is available and underutilized and one of the things we'd like to push to change. This is, I would also put one more thing, this is the, the people who do receive surgery are predominantly uh, white and upper socioeconomic classes. It is underutilized in the minority population that is not entirely, although it's partly due to economics, it's partly also due to cultural issues uh, in, a, in a surgery that's designed to treat a chronic disease. So there's, there's lots of different aspects of epilepsy and treatment of epilepsy that are addressed in dealing with surgical patients. Now again, to draw a distinction between surgery and uh, medication for epilepsy, both have a similar goal that relates to what Dr. McDonald was talking about and relates to surgery. The goal is to raise the seizure threshold such that seizures no longer occur in the course of everyday life. I will repeat again what Dr. McDonald said, any normal brain is capable of sustaining a seizure in the right circumstances. People with epilepsy, it, for reasons known or unknown, the threshold is lowered such that these events occur spontaneously. The goal, whether it be with medicine or with surgery, is to raise that threshold back up so that no longer happens. That can be with surgery, it can be with surgery plus medicine. Combinations still count, but we want to return the quality of life of the patients to normal. In the case of medicine, we're using physiological specificity based on cellular mechanisms. In surgical control of epilepsy, we're using anatomical specificity because we're operating on a, a target, removing something or altering structure. Epilepsy surgery has kind of come full circle over the last 120 years. Uh, from, a constant, from, from a focus on, on substrate, pathologic substrate, through an emphasis on EEG and abnormal electrophysiological function and back more recently towards a focus once again on substrate with the availability of better imaging techniques. So historically in the modern era, epilepsy surgery really started in the late 19th century uh, and most of those early operations in the pre-imaging era were based on physical examination and observation of seizures. Um, uh, Otrid Forster, in the years between the wars in Breslau and Germany, was a pioneer in the analysis of EEG and what it meant uh, in normal function in epilepsy. And many of the leaders in North America uh, in the EEG and epilepsy field went to study in his laboratory. Among those was Wilder Penfield, who came back and in cooperation with 
at Jasper, first in Rhode Island and later in, in Montreal, uh, developed this whole focus on abnormal uh, electrical activity on the brain as a tool for the surgical treatment of epilepsy. This, this was used both for passive recording from the brain in resection around tumors uh, and for mapping of the brain to look for uh, function in eloquent cortex during surgery. It was really out of this use of the EEG as a tool, a supplemental tool at surgery that the idea arose of using EEG as, an, as a, uh, a workup uh, way of investigating candidates for epilepsy surgery. It was not until the uh, 1940s work of Frederick and Erna Gibbs at Boston University and later University of Illinois in Chicago that epilepsy identified by EEG as originating in the temporal lobe led to the most common form of epilepsy surgery done today, which is a variation of temporal lobectomy. Um, so during the 1930s, 1940s, the emphasis was really on analysis of the electrical signals coming from the brain as a tool to diagnose and treat epilepsy, including to guide surgery in those days. In the 1950s and 60s, imaging techniques began to improve. One of the first, um, first uh, pioneers to do this, to uh, take use of these, uh, to make use of these new uh, technologies, was uh, Telerac and, and France, and later uh, Crandall and Aidy at UCLA, who used stereotactic techniques, techniques designed to carefully deliver uh, therapies and tools to specific targets within the brain to analyze not just surface recordings as had been done previously, but to look at parts of the EEG, parts of the electrical activity in the brain arising from specific regions deep inside. That technology led to what I'll show in a little bit, uh, what we call today phase two invasive intracranial monitoring as part of the workup for candidates for epilepsy surgery. So just to review for a moment, epilepsy is a syndrome of recurrent discharges and this reflects the interaction of a pathological substrate with neurophysiological mechanisms that control seizure threshold. Again, Dr. McDonald spoke a little bit about seizure threshold, and towards the end of his talk was talking about mutations. Well, it, there's, this gets into the gray area of where variations of normal become abnormal. Clearly, just as people differ in other aspects, they differ in what their seizure threshold is and whether a person develops epilepsy on the basis of having a meningioma, for example, has to do not only with the presence of that tumor, but with the, the uh, ambient seizure threshold in that person's brain in that particular area. So there's, there's as I said at the beginning, uh, the idiopathic and the symptomatic epilepsies come together in a way here. Um, Dennis Spencer at Yale, as part of the uh, modern uh, analysis of epilepsy surgery and, and what it works for, what it does not work as well for, emphasized getting back to the pathologic substrate that underlies these so-called symptomatic epilepsies and divided these substrates into five major categories. Tumor, uh, cortical migration abnormalities, such as cortical dysplasia, predominantly seen in children, vascular malformations, and I would extend that to include things like stroke, mesial temporal sclerosis, which is a, a specific pathology of the mesial temporal lobe that's not entirely understood, and, and post-traumatic epilepsy. And again, the goal of surgery is to raise that seizure threshold around these lesions. It, it's an interesting fact that while the lesions are there 100% of the time, the seizures only occur a very small fraction of the time uh, and, and the goal of the surgery is to lower that fraction. So, again, uh, the, his, the epileptic cortex is another way of referring to the use of electrophysiology, EEG monitoring to guide surgery. This was a, uh, an approach that came out of Montreal, out of the work of Wilder and Penfield, that has, has been championed uh, in Seattle for a long time, and that uh, traditionally for um, cortical and Hippocampal epilepsy relies on awake mapping of function and recording of interdictal, meaning the abnormality seen on EEG between epileptic seizures to guide surgical resection. The epileptic substrate model is surgery designed to remove the identifiable pathology seen on imaging techniques. What's interesting is if you look at uh, 
publications from centers that follow these two different philosophies and, and draw what they actually remove at surgery, they are remarkably similar. So getting kind of down to the, the meat of how this is actually done, evaluation of surgical candidates, this is the number one, number one slide that I, I would like people to take away from this. The surgery that I'm talking about today is quality of life surgery. This is not operating for aneurysms or tumors. The operations that we're talking about in epilepsy surgery are designed to improve quality of life. You can make an argument about seizures reducing life expectancy, but I would never talk to a patient about operating on them to save a life. We do this to improve the quality of life. We do this to allow, allow people to drive again, to swim again, to do the things they can't do. That's the goal of an epilepsy operation. This starts with EEG recording to document the seizures, to see what type of seizures they are and where they're coming from. It starts with imaging studies, which include CT scans, more commonly MRI, specialized studies, a SPECT and PET, uh, newer modalities such as magnetoencephalography. Uh, the improvement in imaging studies has meant that many fewer patients need to go on to intracranial monitoring. The next phase in workup is neuropsychological testing, which is often very effective at localizing areas of functional abnormality in the brain. And carotid amylobarbital testing. Uh, in a patient who is being considered for surgery, particularly with temporal lobe surgery, we want to make certain that the area we're proposing to take out is not essential for function. This is a very interesting test in which uh, carotid amylobarbital, which is a rapidly metabolized uh, uh, barbiturate, is injected into the uh, into the vasculature of the brain in the proposed area and, and is metabolized on the first pass through the liver. So it puts that part of the brain to sleep for about 10 minutes. During that time, you can talk to the other half of the brain and see what function is <coughs> where. Basically, the, the goal in most cases with this testing is to determine where speech is located and where memory function is. You would not want to remove someone's speech area or take out a part of the brain that's essential for memory. Phase three is intracranial monitoring when the data collected from those other uh, aspects of the workup is not sufficient to tell us what area of the brain we can safely remove. Sometimes we need to actually put electrodes onto the surface of the brain or using the stereotactic techniques developed in the 1960s, uh, put electrodes actually into the brain to try to determine where seizures are originating. This is uh, a uh, plain x-ray of the skull of someone undergoing intracranial monitoring. And you can see that sometimes we go on, on uh, fairly big fishing expeditions looking for where these things are coming from. This is what that looks like at surgery. Again, you, you'll notice on the right side there that uh, the hair is not shaved. Um, it, it is, again, back to the point that this is quality of life surgery. Even when we need to do these extensive intracranial monitoring procedures, we're keeping in mind that we're trying to, uh, to to make people's lives better and more pleasant, and it's it's never a nice thing to uh, take a, a young woman with long hair and shave her bald. So we try to avoid things like that. Now, what you see on the left is the dura mater over the brain closed with the electrodes coming out. On the right, after uh, finishing the surgery, these are coming out through the skin. The patient then goes to the intensive care unit and is monitored by video with these wires hooked up to an EEG. Uh, while the medications are gradually lowered until the patient has their typical seizures, and we can usually find uh, with very great precision where the seizures are coming from. Those grids that I showed you in the previous picture will also allow us to stimulate cortex to uh, try to identify areas that are essential for function that can't be removed, such as speech and motor areas. And then we get to surgical resection itself. Um, here's an example of Again, I can't get my, my mouse to work here, but you'll see on the, you can see the little arrow on the right side, there's a little arrow pointing to an atrophy hippocampus. Uh, this is the, that, that's a flare image on the right side, T1 image. I'm showing the same thing, it's a little subtle there. Uh, but this is an example of an MRI showing hippocampal atrophy, which correlates with seizure onset by EEG. This is the most common form of partial uh, epilepsy in adults and the one that's best understood in terms of surgical outcome. Again, as I said before, when we do this, 
we want to keep things pretty. We don't want to shave people's heads. We want to make things as minimally invasive as we can. This is a young lady already uh, asleep for surgery. And just an example of the way that I do this, there are various different ways of doing surgery on the temporal lobe. What I'm showing you here is called a selective amygdala hippocampectomy. Uh, I do this through a single linear, linear incision, just parting the hair like that. On the left side there, that's the exposure. It's about a silver dollar size craniotomy. And you're looking at the superior temporal sulcus uh, running across the upper part of the screen, the Sylvian fissure down where I'm pointing with the, uh, the bipolar electrode there. Um, I use a transventricular approach. So I'm opening through the ventricle, the temporal horn of the ventricle. That's the picture that you see on the right side. The, the smooth white surface that you're looking at there is the hippocampus. And this is what things look like after we're done. We close these with glue so the patient can wash her hair the same day, comb right over it, she goes home. People can't tell that she had surgery. That's the hippocampus. Uh, and one of the pleasures that I'll have when I, I get here in, in a month or so is that I will no longer have to send this off entirely to the pathologist. I'll have someone who can make good use of this tissue. Take this out on the block. Uh, there's a great deal to be learned from this human tissue. I, I used to actually do slice electrophysiology on these things in the laboratory. It would be wonderful to have this put to use again, another example of how we'd like to get this Neuroscience Institute to get some real translational research going. So having these things no longer go to waste will be a real joy. <coughs> Outcome, so how do people do? Why is it worth doing this? The, there's several commonly used outcome scores for epilepsy. The, the one that's most commonly used in this country, there, there's two main ones, the Angle classification and the International League Against Epilepsy. This is Angle's classification, class one is free of disabling seizures, class two is rare, class three worthwhile, and class four no improvement. Uh, this is uh, from 2003, just an overall view of the type of outcome to be expected with the different major types of epilepsy surgery. Red is, is the operation that I showed you, mesial temporal sclerosis seizures originating from the middle part of the temporal lobe. Uh, those have the best outcomes. Tumor also very, very, these are usually benign tumors, very high likelihood of success, very high success rate for uh, seizure surgery. Developmental disorders uh, and other cortical epilepsies are, are less successful, but still the outcomes are far better than the natural history of the disease. My own personal experience at, at Kaiser a few years back, we looked at our two-year outcomes, which has been the standard for many years. It's now becoming apparent that we probably need to look at 10-year outcomes. But on 112 patients operated between 2001 2008, uh, of the ones that uh, for which we had followed, we had an 83.5% seizure-free rate, which fits in well with the established literature. Now, what are some other things besides open surgery? Uh, there's been a study ongoing now for a number of years based out of uh, the UCSF program in San Francisco using focused radiation to destroy the hippocampus for that particular type of epilepsy with, with some success. Uh, it takes longer to work. It does have some side effects in terms of swelling and so on, but this may be a useful tool in patients for whom open surgery is not an option. Vagus nerve stimulation. Uh, this was based on um, observations made in rats, tail flick experiments during the 1960s, but Basically, nobody knows exactly how this works. I would think of vagus nerve stimulation as deep brain stimulation for epilepsy using the vagus nerve as the deep brain stimulator. It changes brain chemistry in some way to raise that seizure threshold. And for patients who are not candidates because they have seizures coming from more than one location or whose seizures cannot be well localized, in many of them this is an option. It is never a cure for epilepsy, but it can produce some beneficial results in select patients. Other surgical things that uh, are on the horizon and for which we'd like to, to kind of get the Neuroscience Institute involved. Um, there was a, a fashion about 10 years ago uh, for something called multiple subheal transection in areas from which seizures originated but which could not be cut out because they contained important function like speech or movement. Uh, the idea was that you would prevent the spread of seizures through the brain by making cuts orthogonal to the axis of the gyrus. Uh, 
varied success. Some people believe strongly in this, others not. It's not used much anymore. Um, corpus callosotomy, dividing the two halves of the brain to, do, to prevent generalization of seizures, another strategy that's been used historically for many years, not so much anymore with the vagus nerve stimulator. Exciting things on, on the uh, horizon, open loop stimulation includes vagus nerve stimulator that I just showed you. Deep brain stimulation, primarily anterior thalamus, is the main target for that. Mixed success with that. Uh, obviously an invasive procedure, also a type of brain surgery, uh, usually used for people who are not candidates for resection. But again, in all of those things, we're kind of blindly stimulating to alter the functional tone, the chemistry of the brain to raise seizure threshold. Uh, Neuropace is a, uh, a newer strategy, and you see a little picture at the bottom. This is closed loop simulation. In, in this strategy, we're actually detecting seizure onset, and it requires intracranial monitoring first to localize sites of seizure onset. This is a strategy, again, for people who have seizures originating in areas that can't be removed or from multiple areas, and it involves kind of a pacemaker that detects the onset of seizure and zaps it. Again, this has usually not been a cure. It is as effective, maybe slightly better than vagus nerve stimulation, obviously a lot more invasive, but this is another example of work in progress and the sort of thing that presents an opportunity for us here. So, just to conclude, epilepsy surgery is not a new idea. It's among the oldest and most effective procedures that we have in the neurosurgical armamentarium. There are very few other things we do in neurosurgery that can boast 80% success rates. Surgery is underutilized, as I said at the beginning, particularly in in certain populations for a number of reasons. Uh, the advances that we've had in imaging and localization have meant that the, uh, the need to perform invasive monitoring has decreased and the number of candidates who are, are potential uh, beneficiaries of this kind of surgery has increased. Uh, I think some of these newer techniques that are on the horizon, particularly what I showed you about non-resective strategies, closed loop and open loop, make this a more acceptable idea. And finally, as, as uh, Pete Engel has repeatedly emphasized, this type of treatment should be considered early uh, when medical control has failed to control seizures and before the long-term psychosocial damage of epilepsy has, has really uh, devastated patients. It's an old observation in epilepsy surgery that people who were working with their seizures continue to work when their seizures are cured. People who are not working with epilepsy rarely go back to work after their surgery simply because the psychosocial damage is done. And, and for an old Trekkie like me, I couldn't resist putting this in this little comment. If any of you remember this movie, uh, Borenz and Chekhov's brain took a beating in that series. He had, he had the giant earwigs crawl through his brain, and in this movie, he had an epidural, and, uh, and, and McCoy was, uh, it was railing against the neurosurgeon for proposing to drill holes in his head. I hope that the future, led by places like the Neuroscience Institute here at Wright State, will lead to strategies based on the kind of thing that Dr. McDonald was talking about. I think there will always be a need and a role for surgical delivery of systems and for uh, analysis of seizure onset, but hopefully we will have something better than what we have today. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Uh, Bob Putnam from the Department of Neuroscience, Cell Biology and Physiology. Um, it's a little, perhaps a little bit off topic, but I'm interested in, in your experience with these patients where you remove part of the amygdala. Are there uh, effective sequelae? And I'm especially interested in the, in the potential role of the amygdala in things like fear and panic disorder. Do you have do you see sort of more subtle behavioral changes associated with that? Or you're doing it, I assume, unilaterally, so... You doing unilaterally. You cannot do this bilaterally. Uh, you know, most, most of us have heard of patient HM who had bilateral uh, hippocampal surgery and, and, and thought it was 1946 for the rest of his life. Um, the answer is no, we don't really see that. And, and I think in, it, it's, it's for two reasons. With mesial hippocampal sclerosis, that is really a perinatal uh, insult. And most of these folks, when you do the, the WADA test, the amabarbital test, you find that there's not much function on the side affected by the epilepsy. That what we're taking out is really doing 
little other than causing trouble. I mean, there are exceptions. You do see some people with, with function there. But I, I think that having the one amygdala is probably enough for, both of the, for, for most of these patients. That's part of the answer. Uh, the other is there, there's a, a role, as I pointed out, for neuropsychological testing. And, and in most of these patients, particularly the hippocampal sclerosis patients, the ones in whom you would expect the amygdala to be affected, are, are not normal. It, this, is, this is an aspect of their disease. It is a symptom of the disease, but hippocampal sclerosis has other things going on, and they have other neuropsychological issues, which may very well include signs of amygdala dysfunction, but it's there before you operate. So I, I've not seen, nor have I heard reported from unilateral surgery, anyone developing new symptoms related to loss of amygdala function. Thank you.